Good morning. Let's all pray together. Holy Father God, we thank you. We know that you have saved us through your son's precious blood. And we also know and believe that you are with us as we abide in your body, the Church of Christ. And that here in the Church of God, you are nurturing us so that we can work together for you. And for all that grace and gifts that you have given us, Lord, we thank you. Father, at this time, there's a summer retreat going on. And we pray that through the summer retreat, many more souls would be gathered. And that these precious people may be inspired and that their souls would receive salvation. And that they would have the desire to receive salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, also we pray for those new souls that have already received salvation through the summer retreat, that they may live the rest of their lives with you until the very day they enter into the kingdom of heaven, that you may guide them and guide all of us together. At this time, there is a summer retreat going on. And in this, and during this summer retreat that's taking place, we pray that you may be with them, that your mighty work of the Holy Spirit may take and be revealed among them. And please be with us at this time and work through us at this time. And today, the Sunday morning, We have gathered here before the presence of your word to reinstate our hearts for you again. Lord, may you open our hearts even more. And we pray to all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved and saved us. Amen. The choir will sing for us. Let's turn to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. 
Gospel of Luke 17. Verse 20 to 21. Luke 17, 20 to 21. Let's read together. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. As we live our lives in this world, there's a few important things, and one of them is what nation you belong to. As you live your life in this world, or many people that live their lives in this world, the sorrow and the discomfort that they feel when they lose their nation and their country, we've witnessed it as time goes on, as time on time on and on again. Even in Korea's history, there was a time where the Korea has lost their nation for over decades, and they suffered much. Many people were extremely saddened, and many people had even suffered their lives or risked their lives for the independence movement, for the liberation of South Korea. And to obtain a nation's citizenship is very important. For example, the United States. Many people work so extremely hard to become an American citizen. I know that on for the record. And now, because Korea has developed into a first world nation, many people want to receive Korean citizenship. We are people, especially for those of us that are born in Korea, those that have obtained the Korean citizenship as they were born to this country. That is your nation. And that nation that you belong to, that you have your citizenship for uh, or of, has laws. And you must follow these laws. And these laws are what rules and dictates the rules, the land. Through the law, people are governed. That is why... For God, everything that God has spoken, it is the law of the world. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. The law, the words of God is the the highest and the most sovereign law. When you keep the word of God, that is keeping the laws of God. And what also that means is that you're under the ruling of God, the authority of God. And that is very important to understand. A nation means that you belong as a citizen of a citizen of that nation that you are under the same governance you are protected and you have the same right and privileges and the benefits that you can share as fellow citizens it is a unity a, a, a nation a country forms unity for example israel israel they were enslaved in egypt for 400 plus years they were enslaved they had no such thing as a nation a country And that is why they suffered a lot. They went through a lot of torment and suffering. And they cried out to God in the midst of their torment. And for a nation or a country, there is always someone that's in power. And who was the most powerful being of Israel? That is God. And that is why the nation of Israel, they were ruled by God, directly ruled by God. And therefore says in the Bible, I, I the Lord have spoken. Therefore, God has highly exalted and has spoken that every knee to Jesus should bow and everybody should bow to the king. And he says, present your case, says the Lord, bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. And the Lord says in Zephaniah, the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. God is protecting us, your Israel. And furthermore, God has power and rule over all nations, all things. And that is the nation of Israel, where God is the supreme authoritator and the the ruler of the law. God is the true God. He's the living and the everlasting king. That's that's what it says in Jeremiah 10.10. That the nation of Israel, they were freed from Egypt and they went through the life of the wilderness and once they came into the land of Canaan they had to conquer the tribes of Canaan and they built themselves a nation in the land in the land of Canaan the promised land and it is not 
that they kept the laws of God, but throughout their history, they went against the laws of God, and therefore God, as His rule always is, there's always a disaster of disobedience and and prosperity of rewards with obedience. When the nation of Israel obeyed the word of God, they prospered. There was peace in the nation. And they lived and thrived. But if they did not obey the word of God, then they were persecuted. They were, they were destroyed. And that is why in the time of Babylon, for 70 years, they were taken away captive again. They lost their nation. And then after 70 years was up, they returned. And once they returned over and over again, they continuously went after, turned their backs against the word of God. And as a result of that, even after they have returned for 600 years, Pretty much after the captivity of Babylon, the nation of Israel was destroyed about 606 BC. So for 600 years, they did not listen to God. And until Jesus came for over 600 years, they were lost. They had no nation. They were destroyed by Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome over and over again. They were always being conquered left and right. And that is why the desires was independence. Israel wanted to be an independent nation again, to restore themselves a nation again. And in the time of Christ, when Christ was on the earth, the people of Israel, they knew they had a land. They knew they had a people, but they knew that they had no one in power to rule and lead them. They had no leader. And therefore, they sought Jesus to be that leader. And therefore, they really prayed earnestly and desired the nation of Israel to be restored and that kingdom of God would come to pass again. That's what they were waiting for. And that is when Jesus Christ came into the world. And in the midst, in, in the midst of Roman Empire and their power, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, came into the world. And we know this. And Jesus, as he was on this earth, he said, I am the Messiah. Jesus said that the Messiah that the Old Testament prophesies about is me. I am Christ. And therefore, when the Samaritan woman by the well, she asked Jesus, she said, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us everything. He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. I am Christ. And not only that... Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He said, I'm God. And that is why the Jews, they went after the life of Jesus because not only did Jesus go against the Sabbath, but he said that he equated himself next to God. Jesus claimed that he was God and therefore to the Israelites, to the religious leaders of Israel, to them that was the greatest offense. They saw Jesus as to be some sort of carpenter's son who was born in the city of Nazareth. And one day he left home as a carpenter's son and then he appeared before everybody. All of a sudden, he had a few disciples from here and there, started to perform miracles. And people like that have existed in the past. But the problem that the Israelites saw of Jesus is that Jesus said that he was the Messiah, that he was God. And they despised the Lord Jesus for that. And especially for the religious leaders that were living especially hypocritical lives, the Pharisees, the rulers, the Sadducees, to those people, Jesus criticized them and says, you must clean the inside of the cup that the outside of the them may be clean also. You don't have the kingdom of God within you. You are a part of the devil's world and you are lying to yourself saying that you are serving God and Jesus criticized and rebuked them. And he said, serpents, brood of vipers, how would you escape the condemnation of hell? And they were offended. They despised Jesus. They said to Jesus, you know who I am? I am a ruler of the Jews. I'm a Pharisee. I'm the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm the Sadducees. I'm people who practice this religion. Who is more righteous than me? Who is more righteous like me? If there's anyone more righteous, let them come forth. They were very bold. They were very confident in their faith. But Jesus went up to them and said, otherwise. And Jesus at the time, he was arrested. And he was being questioned and trialed by Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of Israel? And he answered and said, It is as you say. That's right. I am the king of the Jews. I surely am. I am a Jew and I am a king of the Jews. Then, 
if he, if Jesus is king, then he's got to have people, sovereign. He's got to have citizens. He's got to have an army. He's got to have the ability to protect his nation and himself. But yet he has none of that. And Jesus says he's king and Pontius Pilate couldn't understand or comprehend that. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said that. When Jesus was arrested, he came here to be arrested, to die on the cross, to shed his precious blood, to save mankind and to suffer. And to say it is finished and to bowing his head, to bow his head and, and say it is finished. And after he was buried or he was put into the tomb, three days later, he was resurrected. He resurrected with the body that he had, a resurrected body. And he appeared before the disciples again. And Jesus, who resurrected always, he, he revealed himself to people that believed him, to the people that believed him as the Messiah, as Christ, to born again Christians. He, Jesus Christ appeared to all of them and revealed himself to them. He appeared to the disciples, to the 500 brethren, and instantaneously he revealed himself. And for 40 days, as he was on this earth, after his, ascent, after his resurrection, he spoke of the kingdom of God, preached the kingdom of God, and the time of his ascension came, and all the brethren gathered together. And they asked Jesus this important question. They saw that Jesus was Messiah. Jesus saw his Christ. Jesus died, and he came back to life. People said, you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and even Thomas, one of his disciples, he said when he saw disciple when he saw Jesus resurrected and he touched Jesus, he said, "My Lord, my God." <clears throat> Finally, the kingdom of God is about to take place. The nation of Israel is going to be restored. That's what they believed, and they asked this question. Let's turn to Acts one. Acts one. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. The book of Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8. It says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times, no times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, Verse 8, let's read together. But you shall receive power with the whole, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The disciples are asking Jesus a question. And the question that they're throwing at Jesus is regarding the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And they're saying, Jesus, Lord, is it now the time... That Israel will be restored. That isn't it time now that Israel would be independent from the conquering of Rome. That they may have power once again. That they may have authority once again. And that you now, the king, the Messiah, the king of kings may take his throne and rule this world. Just like how Israel back in the days destroyed the tribes of Canaan and declared that land their land. Isn't that that time? Isn't it that time? They're asking Jesus this question. Lord, is it time to restore the kingdom of Israel? But no, Jesus said, no, it is not for you to know times or seasons. Because we're talking now about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God takes place when the Holy Spirit comes. And in 10 days, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you shall receive power. And you shall be witnesses. To me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You will declare me. You will preach of who I am. That the kingdom of God may be constructed by you doing so. Right? That's what Jesus said. The nation of Israel. They knew that just like how it was promised in the Old Testament... Once their expectation of Christ being their physical promised Messiah that will restore them and set them free from Rome disappeared, they went away from Christ. Let's look at Matthew. Turn to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. <clears throat> verse 42. And verse 42 and 43. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures 
The stones which the builders have builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, verse 43, let's read together. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits of it. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Go back to verse 42. It says uh, when in that the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. This is actually a direct quote from Psalms 118 verse 22. But now this is talking about the chief cornerstone in the kingdom of God. That is Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ will and has become that chief cornerstone. And from him, the kingdom of God, the real kingdom of God will start and will expand and be built. God, when he built Israel, as he was building Israel, he made sure that the king of Israel would be God. But Israelites, they wanted a physical king that the people of the world had. And that's why Samuel prayed to God, God, the people want a king that they can see for themselves. They're turning away from you. They're asking for a king. What do you want me to do, God? The nation of Israel. They do not want me. They have rejected me, not you, that I should reign over them. And they have forsaken me. And they want a king just like the people of the world. Not for you, but they have rejected me. And God granted Samuel to build to let them have a king. And therefore, after that, we had King Saul and on and on and again. And ever since Saul, the nation of Israel, had a physical king, but that is not really the kingdom of God. It was not a nation where God could really portray the kingdom of God through them. For example, even King Saul, he was a king for 40 years, but it was not a kingdom or a, a throne that God recognized. Saul wasn't really king for 40 years because God didn't foresee Saul as a king. David, he also was a king for 40 years, but he spent his time with God and ruled with God's wisdom. But at the time, he had a time where his own son rebelled against him and he was kicked out of the city of David and had to run away and had to come back. And there were times when he had committed sins. But still, it was not really the kingdom of God that God really wanted to foresee and show Israel. And therefore, when Jesus was born in this world, he said to Mary, when Mary bore Jesus Christ, God said to him, you are taking the king of God who is in your womb. Let's look at Luke, Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Gospel of Luke 1. Verse 31. We'll look at verse 30, from verse 30. Verse 30. You know, we know that Gabriel, he was an archangel that delivered this message to Mary regarding how she conceived Jesus. And this is what he said, verse 30. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Verse 33, let's read together. 33, let's read together. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. This is the kingdom of God, the son of God in his kingdom. He will be king and you have just taken this king into your womb. And that's the annunciation where angel Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel speaks to Mary. In verse 35, it says, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Let's read the rest together. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The Son of God. The part of the Trinity. And when Pontius Pilate asked Jesus this question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus surely said, yes, it is as you say. And furthermore, 
Jesus will come as the king of the world again. That's gonna, what's going to take place in the millennial kingdom. And right now, on this very moment, God, His kingdom takes place and starts from the heart. And that kingdom is being expanded from the heart. So when Jesus Christ, He was He, he, he came to about, He grew of age and was tested for 40 days and tempted for 40 days by the devil. And then he receives baptism by John the Baptist. And after John gets arrested, Jesus begins his public ministry. And once Jesus' public ministry began, Jesus said and finally spoke and preached. And he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God, right? Only in the gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of God is mentioned. Other places, the kingdom of heaven is only written in Matthew. Other gospels say the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, that is the kingdom of God. But that definition is only written in Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. And they're the same thing. It's the kingdom that's up in the heavens. And that heavenly kingdom is God's kingdom. And it is at hand. It is near at the doors, Jesus said. As he was preaching during his public ministry. And Jesus, he continuously say, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. And in order for you to become the children of God's kingdom, in order for God's kingdom to come to pass in your life, you must repent and believe in the gospel. And this through the conquering of Rome. Many Israelites lost their lives. But despite that, there are many people that died for the kingdom of God to expand. And Jesus Christ came here not to establish freedom or give freedom and, from the, and liberty from the Romans. He came here to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven so that people like you and I who are lost in sin can receive salvation. And when we believe in the gospel and we are born again, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, the sons of disobedience, the spirit of the disobedience is dragged away, is, is, is taken away. The Holy Spirit can take place into our life, which is God's spirit. The Lord is spirit. God is spirit. And his spirit now abides in us as born again Christians, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God. That's how it's mentioned. The spirit, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of truth. God's word is true. That is the word of God and his spirit who is in us. The spirit of purity, the spirit of the son. You know, a lot of these spirits are mentioned in the Bible. They're all the same thing. And that spirit, the Holy Spirit, is in you and will come into you. And that only was possible because God, who is the Holy Spirit, has come into your heart. God, the ruler of the heavens and the earth, He rules your heart. And you, yourself, is the kingdom of God. You are the kingdom of God. We are under the law of the nation that we live in. And we are protected by the law. And we must perform the duties as a citizen of our nation. And if the kingdom of God takes place in my heart, if I am now the kingdom of God, God's rules, His laws will take charge of my life. If I do well, I will be rewarded. If I don't do well, then I will be disciplined. The law of God will be enforced in my life. It will take place in my life. Ephesians chapter 1, 13. In whom? You also trusted after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having been believed, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Second Corinthians one twenty two says, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Right? The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He has sealed our hearts. We have received the authority. God has come into our hearts. Second Corinthians 5, 5 says, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And therefore God wants to live within us. First Thessalonians 5, 10, Who died for us that we, that whether we sleep or wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Jesus died for us and we live together with him. We are always with the Lord. So we must, we will live with him with him together 
God wants to live with us and therefore He abides in us. And that is why the Spirit that's within us, that now within us, we're together with the Holy Spirit. And as it says in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And therefore, Apostle Paul in Galatians two twenty, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God is my leader. God is my king authoritator he is my lord and master and therefore god's kingdom will come to pass take place in my in our life and that is why when jesus heard from his disciples this question how can we pray jesus answered to his disciples this is how you must pray you know it's not that you go out and pray and say god help us to keep your law help us to keep this day and this tradition and this holiday for you that's not what jesus wanted it wasn't Jesus. It wasn't that Jesus desired for his disciples to follow certain laws of the Old Testament to follow. No, that's what the disciples may have expected. But Jesus said, "This is how you must pray." In this matter, therefore, pray: Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. To say, God, you you are in heaven. Your thoughts are greater than mine. You are my Father in heaven. First, now you have the privilege to a, to call God a Father because now you have been saved. May your name be holy. Hallowed be your name. And as God, your father, you as his children, make sure that God's kingdom is hallowed. Your kingdom come. Because the kingdom of God is now within us. That the kingdom of God may come to the lives of other people through you. A life of evangelism. And your will be done on earth that is in heaven. Right? This is how we must pray. Whatever God has planned and set forth in the kingdom of heaven, let that come to pass in this world as well. Pray for that. Pray like that. Let's turn to Luke 12. Gospel Luke 12. Since we're already at Luke already, let's turn to Luke 12. I'm sure you're going to find it faster. Use two hands. You're going to find the passage faster. Luke chapter 12. Verse 31, 32. Luke 12, 31, 32. Let's read out loud together. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's true. Seek the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added to you. Everything that you need for you to have and carry yourself in this world shall be added to you. But God will send you into this world. And the Lord has given you eternal life through the Bible through his death. After you have been born again. After you have become the child of God, a citizen of God's kingdom. And the reason why he has made you sons and citizens is so that you can fulfill the ultimate purpose of God, which is for you to seek the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God is complete, this world is going to be done. It's going to be over. This world will not continue eternally. This world, once the kingdom of God has been finished and built, this world is over. The purpose of this world is to exist until the kingdom of God is established and fulfilled. Right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So therefore, you who have the kingdom of God in your heart, you got to understand what your priorities must be. If God is in you, is in your heart, what is he trying to do? What's God trying to fulfill through your life? Seek the kingdom of God. And when you first seek the kingdom of God, then all these things shall be added to you. Everything that you think of afterwards, after the kingdom of God, will be added to you. And then in verse 32, it says, Do not fear, little flock. For those people, the little flock, the few and far in between who are saved, because you're so few in number, as you seek the kingdom of God, do not fear, because it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That is why we are people who will inherit the kingdom of God, even though you may not see certain things. You may not see everything with your physical eyes, especially the kingdom of God. It's going to be there. But this world that you see with your physical eyes is not going to be forever. The kingdom of God that you cannot see is what is to come eternally. That is the kingdom of heaven. And which has begun from Jerusalem until now. And it will keep continuing. 
This is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the threefold trinity where his will and only his will will come to pass. Psalms 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people who has chosen as his own inheritance. The people God has chosen as his own inheritance. Blessed is that nation. The church, ecclesia, with the separated ones. These are the ones that were chosen to be the inheritance of God. Blessed are you. Blessed are that nation. And God desires to give you that nation. That is true. This kingdom of God is in you, is in your heart. And this kingdom of God is taking place, taking light in your heart. And you yourself in your heart is becoming to become the pillars of God's temple. It starts with you. And from you, as God judges this world as time goes on, and as God chastises and judges this world, you will depart from the earth for a little bit. That is what's called rapture. You'll be taken away. And after seven years, once this world has been destroyed, God will bring us back down for the millennial kingdom. He will come back down with us. And then, this entire world, for a thousand years, God will guide and take charge to be ruler over this world again. That is the millennial kingdom where God himself firsthandly will rule this world again. Right now, the authority, the emperor, the king of this world is the devil. It is Satan. But God is going to take that kingdom back from Satan, which was originally his, and he will take it and it will be his. And the king of kings, king of the Jews, king of Israel will be the king, the true king of the millennial kingdom. And from there... Born again Christians, when the kingdom of God is complete, we will all partake. We'll take place with him. And after the millennial kingdom, the thousand years is up. We will go up to heaven again to establish God's kingdom forever, which has already been done. And at that time, once this world is set and done, after the millennial kingdom, we'll go up to God and praise God. And everything that God has planned for in this world will finish, will be finished. It's done. This is the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God that is to come. How can you go? How can you enter into his kingdom? It's not that you're not going to take a test and pass to go into the kingdom of God. No. The kingdom of God is only made to light through the gospel, through faith. That is God's kingdom. It is a kingdom that you can enter when you are saved. That is God's kingdom. When you believe in the gospel, when you are born again as God's children, now you have the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven as your inheritance. You have become children of God. What God desires is that he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants. God wants that before everyone goes to heaven, we have to see the kingdom of God come to pass in this world again. But it's not that just because you say, Lord, Lord, just formally you become God's children. Now, we obviously know that's not the case. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. No, just because you call God Lord doesn't mean you'll go into heaven. You have to do the will of God. What is the will of God? That is that the will of God who lives in heaven come to pass. And that is what God's will is that I be born again as his children, as his child. And it's for us to believe in the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, to be born again, to be saved, and to enter through the narrow gates. And by the remission of our sins, the atonement of our sins, for our dead spirits to come back to life. That is what the will of God is. When we listen to the word of God. When we heard the word of God and we were born again, the will of God came to pass, right? The will of God was made alive and we have become partakers in God's kingdom. That is what it means to be saved through the water and the spirit. The water is to symbolize that Jesus died and he resurrected. And through the death of Jesus Christ, all my sins, eternally, past, present, and future have been forgiven. And when Jesus resurrected, that is the truth. That is the absolute truth that seals that into our hearts so that we can believe. That is why 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When we were saved, 
When we understood and believed in our hearts that I, all my sins have been forgiven 100%, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit that has been promised to us. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit, by being born again, that the kingdom of God may come to pass in our lives. Some people say, well, Jesus has forgiven me all my past, present, and future sins. They say that well with their words, but there is no Holy Spirit in them. That's not salvation. You can promise, you can say all the right things with your words, but that does not mean you are saved. Just because you say my past, present, future sins are forgiven, does that mean you are saved? No. A lot of us, even boring and true boring and Christians, have been deceived by that. People have stolen money from us saying that they are saved. This really happened. It's that when the true Holy Spirit abides in us, Jesus Christ will become our Lord. Jesus Christ will become our King. Jesus Christ will take full charge and power of their life and the kingdom of God will come to pass. To say that one is saved, that happens to the word of God and that is to the gospel. As we know very well, let's turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Peter 1, 23. 23. 1 Peter 1, 23. 25. 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible to the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away, and its flowers falls away. This is pointing to the world. Verse 25, let's read together. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. The word of God is this gospel. This word of God is what saves us. This is what's incorruptible. This is the incorruptible seed. That is why in the gospels, especially in the parable of the sower, the seed is the word. You all know that. The seed is the word of God. And that is the word of God that will not corrupt away, decay. You must be saved by the word of God to become children of God, to become God's people, citizens of the God's kingdom. This isn't, this isn't something that's given to you because you're smart. No, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to listen to the gospel. You got to listen to the truth. You have to have a person that shares this, that preaches this. And God has to send you that person to preach it. So that's why in scripture says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him who they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? That's why faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that is why God, through the foolishness of evangelism, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message, preached to save those who believe. What is the greatest work Jesus has done? Jesus' greatest work, greatest miracle was to preach the gospel, the message of how he will save the world. That's why when Jesus was at Galilee, as he began his public ministry, as his ministry began, you know, he spoke a lot more in Galilee than compared to Jerusalem. He went through Galilee and he taught in the synagogues and said about the kingdom of God that is to come. He shared about the gospel. And another Bible, and another interpretation of the Bible and the gospel says he preached the kingdom of God from city to city. Preaching the kingdom of God is preaching the gospel. Luke 4. We're looking a lot, referencing a lot in the book of Luke. I'm sure Luke really likes it. Luke 4. Luke 4, 43. Gospel of Luke chapter 4, verse 43. Sweet together. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. Jesus Christ was sent by God. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God has sent Jesus Christ. For what? Why was Jesus sent? So that he can preach the kingdom of God to the cities. That's what Jesus said. 
Chapter 8 of Luke, verse 1. 8, verse 1. Now, it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing, let's read the rest together, the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. As Jesus was teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God, he went through city to city. At this current time, Israel had no power. They were under the conquering, the authority of Rome. Israel did not exist. They were conquering. But Jesus Christ went through all the cities and said, this is the kingdom of God that is to come. This is how you will enter the kingdom of God. This is what you must believe, which is the gospel. And he preached it about the God's kingdom. It's not just something that you imagine. No, it really exists, Jesus. His kingdom is not here nor there. It is in you right now. Here is the kingdom of God. If this is the kingdom of God, some people say they start to button their jackets and say, wow, this is the kingdom of God. I didn't know that. I didn't know that this was the kingdom of God here. But that's true. though. It is the kingdom of God here. Because the disciples... Even the disciples of Jesus, when they heard about the kingdom of God? Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. This is what the disciples did. Acts chapter 1. As Jesus died, resurrected, he continuously shared about the kingdom of God to the disciples. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Acts 1, 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus spoke about things pertaining to God's kingdom. And as Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, what that means is, is that he's not talking about the kingdom of God in heaven because he cannot speak of that. People wouldn't understand it. This is like as if you go to a caterpillar and say, hey, caterpillar, you're going to become a butterfly later. But the caterpillar doesn't know that. He's never been a butterfly. Apostle Paul, when he went to heaven, the third heavens, he saw and heard tremendous and glorious things. But he said that he cannot put it into words. Why? Because you and I will not understand it. The kingdom of God is a place that is un- in- not speakable. You cannot incorporate and expect to put God's kingdom into our limited knowledge. Apostle Paul said, I won't even speak of it. Even the Apostle John, as he saw in the revelation of God's kingdom, he didn't say, Well, there are these treasures, these jewels, and these pearls, and this gold. Yes, he used that as a reference for us to understand, but he cannot get into detail what God's kingdom looked like because we will not be able to understand it. We will know when we go into the kingdom of God, when we enter. So, when Jesus has spoken the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, what exactly is he talking about? He's talking about preaching the gospel. He preached the gospel. The disciples, how are they like? They preached the gospel. They continuously exhorted, rebuked others of the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, verse 8. Acts 19, verse 8. It's okay. If you didn't find it, I'm just going to read it. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. For three months, he reasoned, he persuaded, and he spoke about God's kingdom, Apostle Paul. Chapter 20, verse 25. Chapter 20, 25. Acts 20, 25. Let's read together. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Apostle Paul says, I indeed, and indeed, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. He preached the kingdom of God. Acts 28, verse 23. 28, 23. So, 
When they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, whom Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. He pretty much preached a one-day Bible seminar to everybody that visited him. Verse 31, let's read together. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Jesus. See, Jesus says the kingdom of God will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. The end of the world will come when God's kingdom is preached to the world. The end of the world relates directly to God's kingdom. When God's kingdom and the gospel of God's kingdom is shared to all the people, then the end will come. That's what's going to take place. We are living in that time right now. And God's kingdom is we can enter into the God, kingdom of God when you're humble. When you look at born-again Christians around you, you can see that a lot of born-again Christians are very humble. Very, very humble. Very kind. Why? Because without that trade, you cannot be saved. Jesus said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? You have to be like a little kid. Unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You will not. That's what Jesus said directly. God, he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That is true. To the humble, he gives grace. And Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the person who is poor in spirit. Blessed are you who do not feel satisfied by this world. But you seek after the kingdom of God. Your heart is only going to be satisfied when you seek the kingdom of God. And those who know that, you are waiting. These people are waiting so desperately to enter into the kingdom of God. And blessed are those people, the Bible says. In order for that to happen, you have to be poor in the spirit. If you're poor, that means you have nothing. You have nothing to live for and you have nothing in your heart. And therefore, you're searching. You're looking. When you are poor in your spirit, in your heart, you seek after eternal life. You're seeking after God's kingdom. And blessed are you if you seek these things. For God, the kingdom of God will be yours. Jesus, he said, blessed is the poor. For theirs is the kingdom of God. When you look at the Bible, there was a, a ruler, right? There was a young man who was very rich, a very affluent young man. And this young man came up to Jesus and said, Lord, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, what does the law say? Well, he started speaking about all the Ten Commandments. Do not do this. Do not steal. Do not be fair, false witness. This is that. And Jesus said, look, keep all them. And you will not. Keep them all. And the young man said, I've kept them from my youth. And then Jesus said, give up all your things. Give it to the poor. Share your poor, your treasures that you have now to the poor and follow me. That's what it means to love what a neighbor. Love them as yourself, right? But when this young man, this young affluent man heard this, he was very sorrowful. He was very rich and he never came back to Jesus. He had a lot of things. And he never came back. He was sorrowful. The kingdom of God was nothing to him because his world meant everything to him. Because when, he, when Jesus commanded him to do all this, to sell his riches and then come and follow him, he didn't want that. He loved the world still. He did not seek after the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is given to those who are poor in spirit. To those who truly seek God, they can enter. And that is why Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's what it is. That's how it is. It's impossible. It's impossible. When you hold Bible seminars, as we hold Bible seminars, we spent for the first four days or so studying about God. Right? Four sessions studying about God. And we talk about the justice of God, the love of God. 
and we talk about God being the Almighty God, and we seek after God's kingdom, and how can we enter into the kingdom of God? You have to be as blameless as He, as the Lord Himself. You have to be as good as the Lord Himself. You have to be as holy and pious as the Lord Himself to go into heaven. We, that's what we learn. Because the heaven, the kingdom of God, heaven is a blameless place. And you cannot go into God's kingdom with such a sinful state that you are in. Then you start to think, what can I do to go to heaven? What can I do? I'm a sinner that cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is repentance and repent and believe in the gospel. That's what you do. That ever since I was born, I was born as a sinner. And therefore, it's impossible for me to enter God's kingdom on my own works and by my merit. And therefore, Jesus, who had pity on us, came to this world to save us. Jesus shed his precious blood so that all of our sins would be forgiven. Even a penny's worth of our sins were forgiven. And we were called to be righteous as God. Once and for all. Because Jesus Christ has given himself that you have been righteous once and for all. Just like God. Just like how God is righteous. You have become righteous. You are called to be righteous. You are not righteous, but you are called to be righteous. You are not holy, but you are called to be holy. You are now holy because of the life of Christ. That is how you have the right now to enter into the kingdom of God as God's children. Correct? And that kingdom of God is given to those who seek. To those who seek the kingdom of God, you can go. And those who do not seek, they cannot go. God will not give that kingdom to those who do not seek it. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. That's doing everything pertaining to the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God, in order for you to have it, you got to ask it. You got to seek it. And you got to keep knocking in the door of the kingdom of God for God to open up and say and welcome you in. If you seek me, with, find me. If you seek me and search me with all your heart, you will find me. Seek. Not a lottery ticket. Some people spend their entire life buying lottery tickets. And they spend everything that they own to buy lottery tickets and they have never won. But I don't know why they keep buying lottery tickets. We don't have hope like that. It is not some sort of a hope where out of millions of people, one person win. You think that's ever going to be you? That's impossible. You're never going to win that lottery. Do not go after such vain things. We got to be set free from those things. So as Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. That's what it means. The kingdom of God suffers violence because those who seek it violently, they will take the kingdom of God for themselves. Let's look at this. Let's look at Luke. Gospel of Luke 16. Luke 16, 16. Simple to understand. Simple to memorize. Luke 16, 16. We're looking at, we're referencing Luke a lot today, right? Chapter 16, 16. read together the law and the prophets were until john since that time the kingdom of god has been preached and everyone is pressing into it the kingdom of god right the law and prophets was until john since that time the law and the prophets nobody could be called righteous to the law and prophets They cannot enter the kingdom of God that way. But now, since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached to everyone is pressing into it. And everyone is pressing into it. For that to happen, you got to desire the kingdom of God more than anything else in this world. You got to see the kingdom of God to be bigger, to be the greatest. Someone who knows that, someone who seeks the kingdom of God above all things, not not, not by getting caught By the things of the world. But even if you ever had to gain the kingdom of God. By letting something of this world go. You got to buy it. You got to press into the kingdom of God. Let's turn to the gospel. Matthew. Chapter 13. Matthew 13. 45 and 46. 13, 45, 46. Gospel of Matthew 13. 45 and 46. 
three together. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You find a pearl that you really like. That is the gospel of the kingdom of God. When you find it, you sell everything that you have so that you can obtain it. What does that mean? That means you're willing to give up everything that you deem to be precious for the gospel. All the things that you thought were precious, your thoughts or your materialistic possessions or your talents, your abilities to do certain things. All of those things mean nothing more than that. You seek after the truth, the gospel that brings you into the kingdom of God. And for that, you're willing to sacrifice everything and anything for the kingdom of God. That is why Apostle Paul lived like that for his all entire life. The people of the world, their perspective of Paul can be as if he was a failure. He was a wealthy man. He was a very educated man. If he just stayed the way he was as a Pharisee, he could have been very... Um, he could have been an elite among Israeli society, but he forgave all, he forsook all that. He didn't even have a house. He went around preaching the gospel all over the world, suffering over and over, being bitten, being beaten, and being sent to prison. And later he was beheaded. That's the life of Apostle Paul. That's what he lived. That's how he lived. But he even went up to the Roman emperor, the king, and says, I want all of you to be like me except for these chains. Because this, the gospel, is the greatest. It's the greatest thing ever. And therefore, you're willing. He's willing to sell everything that he owned for this gospel. Everything that I have now is not mine. This is God's. That's why Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. That is what he said, and that is how he can say these things. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. You know, it's not like we're going to set boundaries. That's not what the kingdom of God entails. The kingdom of God is what takes place from your heart. We just read that earlier. The Pharisees asked, when? Will the kingdom of God be? When will they come? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Or will anyone say, or will they say, he see here or see there? For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. It's in you. What's in you is the kingdom of God. That's the mystery. God's kingdom is not above this, is not a part of this world, it's above this world. Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Let's look at John. John 18. Gospel, John 18. Verse 35. 18, John 18, 35. 35, 36. 35, 36. From verse 33, it says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium, again called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew, your own nation, and the chief priests have delivered you to me? What have you done? Because Paul, Pilate was not a Jew. Verse 36. Let's read together. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus, is not of this world. It's not a part of this world. It's not for someone to say, see here or see there. The kingdom of God is within us. It's in our hearts. And that is why the scripture says, the kingdom of God is given to those who are 
saved, who are born again through the blood of Jesus Christ, the saints come together, the church, in other words, as this church lives in this world, that is the kingdom of God. That's why 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Apostle Peter says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are the church. You, the church, are a holy nation. You are his own special people. In Revelation 1, 6, And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are, we are God's people. We are God's kingdom. We are now God's royal priest. We are God's people. And we are God. As God's people, we are God's nation, God's kingdom. Now, what are some qualities or characteristic traits about God's kingdom? God's kingdom has always have to have the right to take. It's where there's authority. The power and the might of God takes charge, takes rules over his nation. Am I God's people? Am I God's nation? That question, you can ask yourself by saying, is God's right, is authority, is it all over me? Is God's authority ruling my life, motivating my life? Do I really see and believe that if I do well, God will reward me? If I don't do well, God will judge me and chastise me and discipline me. Do you believe that? Is Does God's right, his sovereignty take precedence in my life? When we come together as a church, that's also God's kingdom. There's a hymn that says, Since Christ my soul from sin set free, this world has been a heaven to me. And mid's early sorrows and its woe, tis heaven, Jesus here to know. Oh, hallelujah, yes, tis heaven, tis heaven to know. My sins are forgiven on land or sea, what matters where? Where Jesus is, tis heaven there. Wherever you walk with Jesus, that is the kingdom of heaven. That is the kingdom of God. Even the kingdom of God that I will never imagine to see. We thought that was very far away. But no, when I look into my heart, the kingdom of God has come to my heart, has come to pass in my heart. Therefore, I am joyful every day. Wherever the Lord would be, land or sea, what matters where, where Jesus is, tis heaven there. To abide in God's kingdom. That is a privilege. Let's turn to the book of Romans chapter 14. Verse 17. 17. Verse 17. Romans 14. 17. Three together, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is God's kingdom. And because this is where God's kingdom is, there's righteousness. We're not we're not here because of our own merits, our own righteousness. We are here because of the righteousness of God. God's righteousness is revealed. And for that with that, we are here. Romans 1, 17 says, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In the gospel of God, there is God's righteousness. In the gospel of God, what does that symbolize? What does that mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sinners for us, that we can become righteousness for God. That's where God's righteousness is. It's here. It's here. What is God's righteousness? That is the fact that Jesus' blood made us clean, made us righteous. That is God's righteousness. If God is looking down from heaven to us, is there any sins now? There are no sins. In the eyes of God, God does not remember our sins. How can God still work through us? Because if we had sins, God can't work through us. But He can work through us because we are righteous. In the eyes of God, we are clean. All of us, in the eyes of God, we have no sins. We are so clean. We have been set clean. We have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are a holy nation. We are separated from the world. And in this holy nation, as being separate from the world, there is not a single ounce of sin. And therefore, that's where the kingdom of God abides. There is peace. There is righteousness. Are you peaceful right now? 
Are you? That's why you're falling asleep. If you're anxious, how can you fall asleep? But because you're peaceful, you're falling asleep. Sorry if I put you out there. But there is there's peace. There's comfort. There's joy. You know, you in, the, in your life outside of church, it may be chaotic. But when you come to church, your heart becomes so calm. There's peace. God is saying there is no peace for the wicked. But in us, there's peace. When Jesus resurrected, he came up and he was resurrected and he said, Peace be with you. In the kingdom of God, there's peace. In the, in the realm of God, there's eternal peace. That is why peace be with you to all Christians. That the love grace and peace be upon us and furthermore there's joy joy happiness we're always joyful we're always happy because the gospel of god is being sent and has been preached and this gospel of god has the power to give us so much joy we cannot withstand that joy even though you may you and i may have nothing in christ in god and the joy of our salvation we are happy we rejoice god who has saved us he gives us joy oh happy day oh happy day in God's kingdom, there's righteousness, joy, and peace that will never depart. And furthermore, in God's kingdom, there's God's power. Let's find this passage, 1 Corinthians 4. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 19 and 20. 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 4, 19 and 20. But it will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God, let's read verse 20 together. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. People that speak a lot, their words, they start to say less in church, right? Do you come to church and do you speak a lot more? Do you always say and boast about this is what I do, this is who I am? No, you got to reduce that. But if people are out there saying, I'm this kind of person, I'm that kind of a person, that's not right. But we don't do that. In church, in God's kingdom, we know that it's not in the power. It is not in the word, it is in the power. And even in Jesus Christ, God has anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and the power. Now, God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and power, and you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That power, that might of God is among us. What is that power? That power is the fact that this gospel is what saves people from hell to heaven. This is God's power. That the righteousness, the message of the cross is foolishness knows to our perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where the summer retreat is, that's where the power of God is, because that's the message of the cross that is being preached, the gospel. Let's turn to Ephesians 3, verse 20. Ephesians 3, 20. We find this scripture a lot. Ephesians chapter 3, 20. Let's read together. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. God. Now to him who is God, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. God's words, God's ability has the power to change man, change people. Even in this world, there are rewards and their disciplines. And in God's kingdom, there are rewards and discipline. Apostle Paul therefore says, None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So you must do the same. For some people, they say, Well, I don't need any rewards. I, all I care about is going to heaven. Those are people that have no desire to live a Christian life. That's just like saying, well, forget it. I don't need to be first in my class. I just need to graduate. I just need to barely pass. That's the same thing. There's no motivation. 
You got to work hard. You got to race, finish this race to win, win this reward. You got to look toward the reward. That's a command, a direct order from God. There's so many things God wants to give us. Two things, salvation and glory. Salvation is all 100% by the will of God. You do nothing to receive it, but the glory, it's 100% up to you. It's what you do by your will, by your deeds, in your heart. You got to race. You got to run hard so you can win this. You can, you can obtain this reward. I fought this good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, not to me only, but also to whom I have... Who, but also to all who have loved this appearing. This is what Apostle Paul said. I fought this fight. I finished this race. I kept my faith. I'm good. Now what's waiting for me is this crown of righteousness. We got to understand that there is rewards and there are disciplines. There are consequences. They're very important. Now, even in God's kingdom, just like how it is in this world, if you have, if you have a citizenship of a nation, you have rights, but also you have a duty. I think in a country, in a nation, there are four mandates. First of all, the number one mandate is that you got to educate your people. It's not something that's optional. As a nation, the nation has responsibilities to educate their citizens, correct? We are the same in our Christian life, in God's kingdom. It's not an option for us to come on Sundays, it's not, a, it's not an option. It's not a choice. It's not like a student has to choose to go to school. He has to go to school. We have to mandate education. In the church, the church, if you really break it down, it means a place where people are being taught. That's the meaning of church. Jesus said, come to me and learn from me. Where is the Lord? He's in the church. He's within the church. And we also have a responsibility as a church to see the body, to raise and to work together. When you look at your body part, is there a body part in your body that never works, that doesn't work? No, your eyes, your fingers, your ears, your nose, every single member of the body works. We work for each other. We work for the other parts of the body. We work each other. We work for one another. You know, we don't just say, oh, I'm just going to come. I'm not going to do anything in the church. I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. No, that's not right. You got to do something. You got to find what you're good at. You got to find what you can do. When you come to church early in the morning, some people come super early in the morning so that they can pick up trash, so that they can take out the weeds in the garden. Or they can wipe down the streets, pick up trash, clean the restrooms, whatever they do. They work. You got to understand, some people came earlier than you came today and wiped down these tables and pews. That's working. In the church, there are people that believe in evolution. Well, you may think, who believes in evolution in the church? Well, let me explain. Because when you come to church, naturally, things are in order. The church is clean. Naturally, there's fans running, ACs turned on. Naturally, these things happen. Just because you did not see who did this doesn't mean there are no workers behind it working to serve you. And because of these working hands, the church is growing. The church serves you. Seek not your own benefit, but the well-being of others. If Jesus knows what you're doing, that's all that matters. You don't go up, you don't go up to people and say, this is what I did for the church. You shouldn't even do that. But sometimes people make that mistake and do it. But they are very weak in the faith. That's like a kid saying, Mom, I got 100% on my test. It's the same thing. But we don't do that. We're not boasting of ourselves and what we do in the church. We have an ability to work for each other, to serve one another. As good stewards, you must serve one another. Apostle Paul says, we are God's workers. We are workers of Christ to serve God. We are here preaching the, the gospel of God and we are here and doing the works of God. We have so much to do. You got to find what you can do to serve God's church. And as a nation, another mandate is that you got to have defense. You got to you got to defend yourself. If you don't defend your nation, your your, your nation's going to get run all over. It's going to get stolen. 
our nation, our country, our kingdom. That's God's kingdom. And the devil and Satan is always out there attacking us. Where? Online. You got to keep yourself. You got to defend yourself. You know, there are people that are out there who write articles about our church up online who attack our church. When you look at that, don't just say, hey, stop it. No, or don't overlook it. You got to defend it. Write back, reply to them. Because what they're saying is not true. When you look at those things, say, that's not even what our church teaches. That's not even biblical, what you're putting up there. Encourage them, persuade them to come. I've been to this church for 10 plus years. No one has ever taught me like that. No one ever does those things. Why are you lying up on this online platform? Well, you can comment. Don't just overlook it. You have the right. You must defend. Right? Am I wrong? You have to defend. That's not the case. We live together. We're part of the church together. We must defend. When someone attacks our church online, you can attack, you can reply back by saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Why don't you come to our church, check it out for yourself, and learn. I mean, you can go online to our website and learn to see for yourself if what you are saying right now is what the church teaches. That's not true. You must defend ourselves. Second Timothy. When you look at Second Timothy, Apostle Paul says to Timothy, look, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. The gospel that you have, keep it. The devil's going to try to take that away from you, but you must keep it. The devil's going to try to attack you, to change you, but no, you must keep it. Keep it. You must not let this change. You must defend. There's no other gospel. But some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's what it says in Galatians 1.7. Apostle Paul says, he, he, he really exhorts the church of Galatia, defend the gospel. And he says, I am appointed to the defense of the gospel. People are saying around you, this is not the gospel, blah, blah, blah. blah. But you must defend the gospel. That's how you defend the kingdom of God. Let's say, for example, there was A who was being beaten by B. And B is constantly harassing A and beating A. And C says, well, maybe A did something deserving of getting beat by B. But then C later on realizes, hey, wait, A is not a bad person. B is the one that just without any reason was assaulting A. Because... A is not doing anything about it to defend himself. So C says, why are you beating up A? Well, there's no reason. Then C can help A defend himself, right? That's an example, by the way. You need to defend yourself. We need to defend ourselves, our church. Number four, there are taxes. Uh, we have a taxes. Today... Maybe you come to church and you're just coming and going. When you come to church on Sunday, you know, we give offering. We have tithe. We're not doing that so that we can feed other people's stomachs. We're not doing that so that some people can be rich. No, we don't do that for that reason. I can proudly say that our church, ever since I've been here after salvation, I can proudly say that our church's accounting books are clean. It's made public. That's how clean it is. The offering, the money that is offered to our church, it's so clean. The way we use and spend this money, it's up, out there for you to see. That is why our brothers and sisters can freely, without any doubt, offer. Because we know that the money that we offer to the church is not to benefit one person, but it is to benefit the preaching of the gospel. Every single dime and penny is used to preach the gospel and to help our brothers and sisters serve the church. We know that. We know that and that is proven. And therefore... We know that when we offer what we have to the Lord, that's offered directly to God. And therefore, you can proudly do this. You must pay your taxes. Don't just leave. Some people, they think that, well, I'm going to lose my place in the church if I don't offer. No one in the church is going to do that, but let's not do that. 
in the eyes of God. God speaks to us about the importance of tithing the book of Malachi. I'm sure you've already studied this before. Do not steal from God. We've already studied Malachi and we read that before, so I don't need to reiterate that. But we must play our part. That is what keeps the kingdom of God. And this kingdom of God that's in us will lead to the millennial kingdom. And the kingdom of God that we do not see will come down to this earth from the heavens. And all the people that have rejected the gospel of God, once the time of their judgment is done, we will reign in this world for a thousand years with Christ. It's called the millennial kingdom. Where after that, the true kingdom of God will take place in heaven. Right? After a thousand years. And once a thousand years are up, those who are truly saved will be taken up to God's kingdom. And the kingdom of God will be complete. Then, Jesus will say to God the Father and offer that kingdom of God in heaven to God. That is what the kingdom of God is. The eternal kingdom uh, eternal kingdom of heaven The eternal kingdom of God This kingdom of God that you are at right now It's going to relate directly to the kingdom of God in heaven to come That is why when we speak of the millennial kingdom You know we often reference Babylon Or Metepha Or Greek Or Rome Or King Kingdoms that have like 10 horns that are references of the people, the, the kingdoms that would have power in this world. But besides all that, God will give one person. God will give authority to one nation. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. This is the real kingdom of God that is to come. This is a reference in the book of Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. Daniel two forty four. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Let's read the rest together. And it shall stand forever. This is the millennial kingdom that it's talking about. After or during the millennial kingdom. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 26. It's going to talk to us about what we're going to do in the millennial kingdom. We're going to be ruling as kings. Revelation 20 verse 6. 26. Chapter 20 verse 6. Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in such. I'm sorry. Part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. Let's read the rest together. But they shall be priests. Of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. They shall reign with God as kings, kings, and kings. How great would that be? You'll feel how tremendous that is in the millennial kingdom of God. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Second Peter. Second Peter 3. Verse 10 through verse 13. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for, verse 12 and 13, let's read together. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Verse 12 says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the very day that we will enter into the kingdom of God. 
This is where God's kingdom will take place and continue forever. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. This is where we will go in. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. 2 Peter 1, 11. It says, So, for so an, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This the eternal kingdom, the everlasting kingdom will be for you. For those of you who do not believe in God, what I've just spoken to you for this hour may be unbelievable. Maybe something that doesn't make any sense to you. But look, when Noah was judging or Noah was warning the world about the judgment, the water judgment to come, none of the people believed it. They thought it was a myth. When Lot told everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah about the judgment of God, a fireman, brimstone, even his family, none of them, nobody believed him. When Job, I'm sorry, when Lot said that this place will be burnt up, nobody believed. This world will be judged with fire eventually. And when we speak of these things, nobody will believe us. People might not believe us. But this is God's kingdom that's going to take place. Today, I spoke to you about something very important. Let's pray. God, Father God, we truly thank you. We thank you for saving us from this world and we know that the reason why you saved us is so that we will not just live our life vain vainly or wasting away our life in this world or for the temporary blessings of this world we know that lord you have saved us so that we can have your kingdom as an inheritance as your children as your people to live with you forever and rule as kings with you forever and we know and believe that you have saved us for that purpose Father God, we are really thankful for what you've done. And we pray, especially now, for the working of the gospel to take place, especially now at the summer retreat at the retreat center. The gospel is still being preached to us. Lord, may you be with us and help us so that many more souls can be saved. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.